afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first parallel session with the first lot of teams. Uh, I would like to give an overview of what we have been done uh, since the last uh, Inspire conference up to nowadays, so where we are. Uh, what was done during this year, what is available, what we produce uh, for data specifications, what was our basic approach in all teams, and with that I, I introduced all next sections on data specifications as you saw and Catherine pointed out we have a set of sections to cover the 19 teams of X2 and 3 of data specifications. Uh, and then I come to some conclusions of what was a mission impossible accomplished. Uh, just to recall the ones that may be not so familiar with INSPIRE, uh, those are the teams uh, of the Annex 1, 2 and 3 of the INSPIRE directive. The teams of Annex 1 are done. Uh, we have the regulation uh, covering or already these teams, and no, now we are currently working out teams of Annex 2 and 3. They are 24 in total, uh, and those uh, 24 uh, teams, they are being treated by the thematic working groups, and the work of each thematic working group will, present, uh, will be presented during those sessions by normally the facilitator, so the one who coordinates the work of this thematic working group, or uh, someone that was, uh, let's say, appointed within the team, the thematic working group to present the work in case the facilitator was not available. So, milestones, uh, what was presented as roadmap during the previous, so the, uh, the INSPIRE conference of last year, it was this small slide here, um, where we start from the kickoff and we pr introduce uh, what were the milestones foreseen for 2012, uh, providing data specifications version 2 uh, for the consultation and testing. So we, we started the Inspire conference last year at that point, so where the consultation and testing uh, were open for the stakeholders to participate. And based on the output of this uh, consultation and test, we should deliver the data specifications version 3, which is the base for our regulation on interoperability. Uh, so where we are on those, uh, uh, with these milestones, so this consultation ran, and uh, during summer last year, from 20 of June until October, so 2011, we uh, had a comment resolution workshop where we treat the comments that were common to more than one team, so many of them horizontal, uh, comments that are applicable uh, to be solved by several teams. So we did this uh, inviting experts uh, that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, provide relevant comments that should be discussed in presence and not only by, by mails. We produce, we had uh, an INSPIRE committee meeting at the end of last year where we present the results of this consultation and from where uh, we receive some, uh, let's say, comments on uh, some suggestions the way to orient to work for version 2.9. Uh, version 2.9 was an intermediary version uh, which we provide for internal revision. So it was a, a very important step to see what was the state of harmonization uh, of, or the state of eventual gaps uh, on the data specifications regarding these 24 teams. And uh, on that internal revision, uh, we got the participation of the member states' uh, representatives. From that internal revision, again, we receive uh, comments uh, that were treated and taken into consideration for the further version of data specifications. Meanwhile, we held a workshop on Inspire data specifications and thematic uh, reporting. It was held in March uh, this year, and it was an important workshop where we explain what are the relations uh, f between the work that we are developing within Inspire data specifications and uh, thematic reports that member states are 
uh, obliged to perform due to other thematic uh, legislations. So, uh, after that, we produce the data specification version 3, what you call the release candidate 1, because this is not yet the final version of data specification. The final version will be uh, data specification version 3, which is completely in line with what will be approved as regulation for interoperability. So, it should be no discrepancies, everything must be perfect at that point. We are still not there. Um, we are in, in, as I said, this intermediary uh, delivery. Uh, this release candidate one was delivered by the thematic working groups. And based on that data specifications, we start producing a draft implementing rule, so a draft that, uh, of what will be the legal act, so what will become mandatory for the member states to implement. And this is still a draft. It was uh, provided for revision to the member state representatives. And uh, we are at that point where we receive comments from member states. We introduce uh, those uh, corrections and we consider the comments we receive. Then we'll produce next week uh, the, 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 the version of the, the legal text, so the, the regulation uh, that will be submitted for the consultation of uh, the other service within the Commission, so other DGs, that has uh, somehow to do with what will be decided with this regulation of uh, uh, to implement INSPIRE on interoperability. They can address their comments, their conditions to get it approved, and after that, after all parties consulted, we provide finally the final text that will be then voted by the INSPIRE committee, first and then uh, hopefully by the Parliament and Council. So there I still don't have the V. It's work in progress. Uh, back to the consultation and testing. See, it was a very important exercise we had last summer, and from that exercise we have more than 6,000 comments received. Most of those comments, 5,000, uh, came from the review of the text of the data specifications, version 2. And 994 uh, of those comments were provided as a result of the testing. And uh, for this, uh, for this uh, revision, for these comments, all teams were revised, all teams were commented. So this uh, represents the teams with more number of comments, like geology, it's a, it's, it's a lot. And uh, the same for the testing, all, te all teams were object of testing. And for that testing, um, we had three types of testing. We had the feasibility testing, which was, uh, which was uh, it's not so big, but I can tell you it's 69% of the tests were the feasibi feasibility testing. So, and with this type of testing, um, the, the ones who perform the test wants to see if it's feasible or not to transform the data they have in, uh, in, uh, in real conditions in the countries, if it's possible to perform the transformation and to get it conformant with what was proposed as data specifications by that time. 90% uh, were dedicated or fitness for purpose. This, this is a different type of test where, uh, based on what are already uh, transform data sets uh, to be in line with the data specifications. After that, if what they get is good enough to be used for certain applications. Um, and only 12% of the testers perform both types of testing. Uh, uh, the graphic uh, shows how many testing reports we receive uh, for each team. Uh, agriculture and aquaculture facilities was not tested, so it's it's a let's say it's a not very common team. Uh, so we got no tests uh, reporting, but we got comments anyhow that come into this uh, let's say in this pile. And the teams that were more, more tested uh, was land cover and uh, followed by land use and geology and so on. So 
the stakeholders involved in that testing exercise uh, were 160. Uh, very interesting to note that from that, 64 test coordinators uh, that um, grouped around these test coordinators, 86 partner, partner institutions. So at the end was a very uh, good exercise of uh, grouping and sharing facilities and now how to perform this testing. For all teams tested, it got feasible what was proposed by that time. But of course, with the comments we received, we improved what was version 2 to reach uh, finally the data specification version 3, which will be published on the Inspire website uh, with the name of technical guidelines, so data specifications, uh, technical guidelines. During this period of, course of testing, one of the objectives was to get information concerning costs and benefits uh, available uh, when possible from the exercise of, exercise of testing. Uh, of course, they cannot be fully extrapolated for what's going to happen in real conditions when uh, data producers and so on will have uh, to make the transformations in, the, in, in a real environment, but they give uh, already interesting uh, indications. So the testing exercise that was more populated, that got more uh, participants was for, for the feasibility, as I said, and the, we got out of it that the biggest, uh, let's say, uh, part of the cost involved on the testing exercise was dedicated for training. So studying what was proposed on the data specifications, training the ones that are going to do the work, and then uh, to be able to get to work then. And this is very interesting because it gives us, a, a, in that aspect, I don't think it is uh, different from the, what will happen in the reality, and it gives us a good indication where it's important to foresee, uh, let's say, efforts and, uh, and resources when planning the implementation and the maintenance. Then another piece of the cost uh, imported, so, and it was 28% uh, of, of this uh, total cost. So it, it's very significant. Uh, the other part of this cost was um, to, uh, let's say, to document and testing, um, the, the, uh, to document the results of the testing and management and coordinating of tests because, uh, as I said, it involves uh, several organizations all together. Um, and so on, setting the, the testing environment and so on. So the feasibility, the feasibility testing is more difficult to evaluate the costs. And then we, it, they were, um, and, and also for, for, for the benefits, it's, they are also more difficult and more difficult to quantify. And we group this because of that reason in three uh, major categories that then we can detail. Uh, if we have, let's say, number enough of reports from where to to, to deduce conclusions, um, and we saw that the major benefit that uh, people uh, found on that test was the capacity building. And again, it's a very interesting point. Um, because most of the teams uh, are from an X3, and, and it's um, very uh, according to what we can expect, this, uh, the benefit that was taken out of it on capacity building to put together all these uh, thematic communities to make the testing. Another point that was uh, currently focused as a benefit was to get the, the organizations ready for implementation of INSPIRE. So if they start early with exercise of training, they, uh, trainers um, expect to be earlier in, in easier conditions to implement when it comes the time for that. So the fitness for purpose, for purpose of course, uh, since uh, uh, the, the, the use of this type of test, it must be based on the use cases. And this type of use cases were of several types, and we grouped them in several categories just to show uh, how this testing was performed. So most of the tests were performed using use cases relevant at national level. 
and then second place the ones uh, use cases relevant uh, for regional level and uh, followed by international ones so it means uh, things that are uh, related not only with the European agenda and uh, also cross domain. Interest to see later on once you, if you by chance uh, download the slides, we'll see what is on those columns. But it's also very interesting to, to, to take conclusions from the benefits of, interoperability, of having interoperable data that were obtained from that fitness for purpose testing. And we group them on two categories of benefits, one uh, related with direct use uh, of let's say, the value that users gives to the data and others more related with the, the social value of such a data. And not to go into details on this analysis, but it's something I point you out to, to, to have a look once you download the slides. And it's in agreement with what I said before, uh, better data sharing uh, ability, improvement of that of data compatibility are the ones that score more in terms of, of data and in terms of social benefit is reduced barriers between organizations, one of the most, uh, let's say, pointed out benefits. So what is available from data specification so far? Uh, we are about to, to close this, this phase of development, development, at least it's what we hope is, and so far what we have available, we have a legal frame already available, which is very much important, as we heard today in the panel. Uh, we have the, the, the chance to have a regulation already regarding the interoperability, uh, and it was uh, for uh, the interoperability of special data set, and it includes not to, that it includes a, a common part to all the three annex because at the end the, 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 the special infrastructure must be coherent for all annexes. So it includes a part that is common to all teams but it also includes what is of relevance for the teams of annex one. And then uh, this regulation was amended to include uh, the code lists which were not possible to be included in the, in let's say the mother regulation and now we are working out the draft uh, amendment to that re regulation to include the themes of Annex 2 and 3. And we also have a technical framework for these data specifications that all that, that are used with the, the, the inspired development now as the framework documents. Those framework documents that start to make the analysis of what is going on in terms of the existing initiatives, then define what is the scope of each team, define the generic conceptual model that uh, must be applied when developing the data specifications for each individual team. And this generic conceptual model have been improved to include, the, to include the requirements that came obvious or came present when dealing with teams of Annex 2 and 3. We start also to define a methodology uh, which keeps stable, is still the same, and the guidelines for encoding of special data, which already, as you see, has is evolution just to incorporate the developments for Annex 2 and 3. We have all the data specifications for each team that will be published as technical guidelines, as I said, and we have a new framework document that was uh, uh, submitted to the consultation of the stakeholders during the last year consultation of summer, I mentioned uh, before, which is called, so is what we called D2.9, so following the sequence of uh, numbering these deliveries, and those are the guidelines for the use of observations and measurements and sens sensor web enablement. So uh, the related standards regarding what are the INSPIRE, Annex 2 and 3 data specifications development. Uh, 
plus we also have the ML repository, the GML application schema for each one of the teams. We have feature catalog, feature concept, dictionary and glossary. I have, they are here all in one line because they need to be updated to include developments of an X2 and 3. This is uh, the, the summer work. And we have the guidelines for the cost and benefit considerations in inspired data developments, which were produced by the time we produced the, the Annex 1 data specifications. That leads us to have a methodology to go into the cost and benefit considerations, which we need to use once we propose a draft uh, a regulation. Uh, we have then, we faced with Annex 2 and 3 teams, we, we faced issues not tackled during the previous development, but they are of very much relevance for the teams of, of those annex, and we need to find a common way, an harmonized way to tackle and to solve those issues for all teams, to have a coherent approach uh, between the thematic communities, and those are related with time, how to manage time, other than what was already proposed in the generic conceptual model. Uh, the code leads, there are several types of, uh, with several Characteristics, specific characteristics, let's say so, uh, of, code li of code lists for several teams of an X2 and 3. They are very relevant. How to deal with those issues, how to solve the difficulty issues that you have to give an answer. Uh, we start with a discussion paper on registers and to lead to the conclusion how to deal this in an operational way uh, once uh, people are implementing, eventually related with services. And we have another document on the data quality, uh, which was also part of the subject of uh, a workshop we had held yesterday afternoon here in, the, um, in that building. And then we have a newcomer, which is the abstract test suite for inspired data specifications, which was also presented and discussed in the workshop yesterday. So, the Inspire Directive asks us uh, to inspire to assist policy making in relation to the policies and activities that may have a direct or indirect impact on the environment. And this directive will not only complement such initiatives, so the existing initiatives, um, providing a framework f uh, that enables them to become interoperable, but also it uh, we'll also build on upon experience uh, that uh, are uh, going on in the member states. So, taking this in mind, we orient uh, our work, and this is the, how we did for all teams, we orient our work based on use cases. We consider uh, for, for each team which are the use cases, which are, first of all, the environmental related policies that uh, needs to provide a use case when considering the development of inspired data specifications. And uh, for each one of uh, those policies, we saw what should come out, out of those policies as uh, obligations for the member states to know where inspired should provide uh, a tool to facilitate this work. And by doing that, we came immediately to the conclusion that reporting uh, for those, uh, those initiatives, for those directives, is an issue that is of relevance for all member states because for several domains that are also covered by the teams of uh, the Inspire, Annex 2 and 3 in particular, uh, they are related uh, with the reporting. Of course, member states want to do things once and do not repeat. This is also one of, of the main principles of the directive. Uh, reuse the data, share the data, don't do twice what can be done only once. Um, and this is the, the approach we took and we present during this workshop I mentioned before on the relations between data specifications and the thematic reporting. So this is a, a summary of what was discussed there on that workshop. So inspired data models should facilitate the reporting obligations. They are different things, completely different with, with different governance and so on. But Inspire should facilitate the work of reporting, otherwise uh, something is not, something is wrong with that. And there are several situations that you need to consider because the reporting obligations are not 
equal for all directives in all domains from air to water and whatsoever. And therefore, we need to consider the different cases. And we consider that where there are well-established data flows for reporting, providing special objects and some joint attributes is the role that Inspire can, can, can do at that moment. It can provide the Inspire idea, it can provide the thematic idea, and so on. So to facilitate, to facilitate, um, to specialize uh, what is reporting, what is the data used for report. And this is the case of statistics. They, those data flows are very well established. The communities, as they own process, is already in place. The only thing it's necessary is to get away, to get a special uh, information for the data they have already in their workflows. Uh, this was taken into account by the team of statistical units, for instance, population distribution, and so on. And, and that's it. <laughs> there are only two. Um, where those data flows and reporting sheets are currently being defined, so they are still in the process with the, let's say, uh, relevant uh, thematic uh, groups uh, and so on that are in place to support those directives, the collaboration with this, uh, uh, the, these thematic policies is very important, and it's, as it's very important, the collaboration between the inspired development actors and the working groups that are established to support technically those policies, to ensure those coexistence, to, to, to allow Inspire to provide, uh, let's say, this uh, facilitating tool. And this is the case of the floods mapping, for instance, that which is a group dealing with reporting on marine. But where reporting data flows are not or very generally defined, then Inspire data models may also include attributes covered by thematic legislation so that Inspire compliance data is available to support the reporting. That is the case of the noise mapping. So this is not to explain in detail, it's just to introduce the fact that on the data specifications we have normally the user requirements and the reference material that uh, provide us the, with the necessary uh, input uh, to decide about a core application schema. The, this core application schema it relates to, the, let's say, what we call the high-level use cases, so the applications that are most common within a, a special data infrastructure. This is the part that will uh, become part of the legal act, so it will become regulation, but those core applications can be extended for other applications that it's not the case to become a piece of, of legislation, uh, but they are important because they are related with the everyday work of the, uh, the users of, of the special data for environment. And this we call, we call uh, the extensions uh, to, to the core data model. One of these cases can be related with reporting, but can also be related with uh, many other things. Oops. Okay, so this is for the future. I think I'm talking too much. So for, for, the, for the futures, by the time this uh, reporting evolution uh, goes in, in the way, and by the time the data specifications are uh, approved and start implementing them for the and for the next steps, this is the point from where we have to start discussing with from the extensions that are more related with the specific applications. So what you can do with the data, so this, this is a slide um, to, to explain somehow uh, we will see this type of slides regarding several presentations. So uh, once Normally, the user has uh, an area of application. Uh, in that case, for instance, you can to solve an issue regarding water for consumption. And uh, the first thing a user asks is, what is the data team that is related with, with my problem on water for consumption? And then what is necessary to know is that uh, the geographic, so the, 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 the way or better. The, the team where you can find the information you need depends upon what, uh, what you are looking for. There is no correspondence one team a domain. There is no correspondence between water and a team on the data spec as there is no correspondence between airport 
solution and and uh, and that specifications specific team. So we need to because the the, the things we are looking from different perspectives depending upon the scope of each team. In that case, water for consumptions, uh, we have uh, put here on a square the different inspired teams uh, that can be related with such a topic. It can be the production industrial facilities, uh, it can be the utilities and governmental services. Uh, if we are interested on water treatment plants, for instance, but we, it also can be hydrography if you want to know about water repositories or uh, if you want to know about supply zones, uh, then we, we have to consider the administrative units, uh, the population distribution, um, the utilities and governmental services, and also, which is not here on that blue box, but we also have to consider at a certain moment land use, because this is what it's going to say, uh, what is the use of such an uh, of of one of those uh, elements. Of course, for each of one, the corresponding legislation was considered. So I come to the conclusions. Uh, what you got uh, as out of these years of work since the beginning up to now, um, and I can say that we increase the interoperability already. Uh, although we are still on the road, we still don't have. Uh, the, 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 let's say, the legislation for Inspire uh, Annex 2 and 3 in play, uh, well, uh, approved. But uh, so far, we increase already interoperability. We get for the 34 teams of the Inspire Directive harmonized data models, which facilitate the cross domain applications and analysis and making whatever you want to do with, with those data. We have the consistent reference data uh, and location framework by the reasons I mentioned before, making different reporting data comparable, for instance, which is very much a progress. Reuse data, making it possible to reuse data across domains uh, in a consistent way. And we have a consistent modeling approach that uh, comparable data models facilitate development of new applications. And it's also very important because based on new applications that can be new services and new, uh, and new possibilities for employment and so on. And also it avoids, of course, duplication and inconsistencies. We increase capacity building, uh, and I think this is not only pointed out by, from the reporting, but we also see during the development process where we start for certain communities with a small participation of stakeholders and experts, and where we start uh, from the beginning with a few, and now we see that the people involved are increasing uh, because of the, the process of several consultation process and the open participation on the development. Um, so this capacity building has been improved. And also because people start to see that they get an advantage if they can get access to, to use, for, for their own use, that, that is normally only used by different domain communities. We have the, also the deep involvement of the member states' representative in informal consultations of intermediary documents. I think this is very important to highlight because it represents a big effort uh, of reading intermediary documents, so the ones which are still transitory, but it implies a big effort or investment of time to, to read them, to understand, to coordinate how those comments should be done by the communities that are related with a certain domain, and then to provide constructive comment to, to us, the GRC, uh, to split in the teams to improve the data qualities and finally to get better legislation at the end of the road. And of course we have the uh, dedicated work of the experts inside the thematic working group. So this is work uh, which uh, it was done uh, free of charge, a lot of effort and work hours uh, also in a cross team uh, developments and uh, consensus building and so on. So we have also the discussion papers, as I said, and I think those are very important points to start once you want to go ahead during the implementation and for the maintenance in the future. So they are starting points for training, they are starting points to 
go into more development where uh, it's necessary to make corrections, to improve, and so on. So we have the improved framework document, as I said, and we increase the dialogue between the thematic community, which is also very important. So people don't think that what they have in their community is good enough for them, but they need to start thinking, is it enough, or is it what the other community wants to know about my data? And uh, this we see is already in place. We see the increasing requests from other domain communities asking what to do, namely in, regarding reporting, what to do to become in line with Inspire. Of course, this will not happen from one day to another, but by increasing the, the availability of data, which is somehow starts already, also because as we heard today in the, in the plenary, uh, the obligation on sharing data is already in place. So by increasing this availability of data, by using data, people realize what is necessary to do next. And, and uh, even during uh, the process of that uh, specifications implementation, um, we will benefit from that. And I want to conclude with a point on uh, the data specification uh, which will be called, I mean, which are already called technical guidelines, uh, the importance of those documents. Uh, we, we know that it's, it, it's not nice to have hundreds of pages for some teams, for instance, to read, but they represent, they are very important for the interoperability and for the implementation. Those things will not happen one, from one day to another. We know that we have seven years after the adoption to implement. During this, those seven years, a lot of things will change in the technology and the requirements. So these technical guidelines make the point at a certain date, uh, which are uh, the state, which the state of the art regarding the requirements, and it contains a lot of good practice. It contains a lot of uh, examples how to extend the data for other applications, and it also contains something that uh, I heard that can create certain confusion, which is this technical guidelines requirements, because we are used to say that requirements are the ones that are in the legislation. So they are mandatory, they are law. Whatever is not in the law, in the, in the regulation, they are recommendations. But those recommendations are very important to increase interoperability. We can have a small, uh, medium, high, whatever degree of interoperability and to, to get better results, uh, following as much as possible the recommendation is a step ahead on that direction. And, and those uh, considered technic, um, let's say requirements of the technical guidelines, it means that they are very strong recommendations. They are like requirements, but they cannot be part of the legislation otherwise. Any time that there will be a change on that community, we need to revise the directive to, or we need to revise the regulation, which nobody wants to do every, every here and there. So they are important. We will see by reading the, the, the technical guidelines that they have the reason to be very important and be called requirement, although they are not a piece of the legislation because of, let's say, practical reasons for the maintenance. And the last word is to thank all the experts that have been working in the thematic working groups. They are still available to introduce the last minute uh, corrections that will may happen uh, still during summer, and in particular to the facilitators and the editors that will present from now on the, the other, this and the other sections. Thank you all.